The world knows Paul Stanley as the lascivious lead singer for the legendary group KISS, the fearsome foursome, known for their kabuki-painted faces and their guitar-smashing antics on stage. KISS sold more than 75 million albums. They are wildly popular still today, but now Paul Stanley has turned his talents and donned another mask. Now he's Phantom of the Opera. Hi, I'm Bob, my wife Verna Neal. Paul Stanley, lead singer for KISS, the rock and roll icons of the 70s, the 80s, and again in the 90s. Now Paul Stanley has decided to trade in that star child mask for a mask of another sort. He is playing currently as Phantom of the Opera. This is quite a switch. Guitar smashing, you know, kabuki faces, masks, painted faces. All in the name of entertainment and theater. <laughs> you saw this play the first time uh, a dozen years ago. Yeah, about 1988 I saw it in London. Yeah. And uh, it just connected with me in a way that um, most theater hasn't. And I love theater because I grew up in a, a household where um, um, we were taught uh, the fine arts and, and theater arts and uh, when I saw Phantom in London I just thought that it, it, it touched so many nerves uh, for me I think so many people relate to the the idea of being ridiculed or being mm -hmm. on the outside and wanting to be loved and uh, that additionally with uh, uh, coupled with great music and, and really fabulous staging makes for a, amazing entertainment. How much of the, of the phantom psyche, as you say, it's about wanting to be loved and needing to be loved, even though you're different, even though you might be, in some senses, repulsive. There's a, there's a very strong theme with Kiss, with rock stars. Um, I think, I think it, it, it's um, prominent in, in all different fields. I think what makes all of us, you excluded, because you happen to be beautiful and brainy. <laughs> oh, yes. I paid him to say that, That's yeah. Right. <laughs> and brains and beautiful are a lethal combination. But, uh, you know, for most of us, I, I think that the reason we became performers in the first place was because we wanted acceptance. I think a lot of us grew up uh, feeling that we were the black sheep or we were the people who were kind of on the outskirts or, or the outside looking in. And uh, many of us became performers, I guess, to, to overcome that in one way or another. And uh, I think Phantom, again, relates in, in many ways to all of us and that need for all of us to be accepted. I was reading on one of the, the websites, one of the notes from the websites, that you said as one of your you know, behaviors when you were a child that you've thought better of since. You would knock on the doors of neighbors asking for an opportunity to perform. I was, well, some people are a ham. I'm the whole pig. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, I've always loved performing. And uh, to be given the opportunity to do this um, was something that I really couldn't turn down. I got yeah. a phone call um, in the midst of a KISS tour, actually, because yeah. we were finishing up a, a stadium run through South America and Europe. And I got a call from my agent saying, you know, this may sound a little strange to you, but are you interested in doing theater? And I said, absolutely. That's what, is what I do every yeah, night. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. have you seen the show? <laughs> but uh, uh, they said, it's Phantom in Toronto. And I said, absolutely. And they said, well, you know, you have to audition. I said, not a problem. So, you didn't uh, care after being this rock icon for, you know, more than two decades? No. You know, to me, um, I think the challenge is to always find things that um, maybe make you a little nervous. Yeah. Things that, Push it uh, a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you're not challenged and if you're not nervous about what you're doing, perhaps you're not pushing yourself hard enough. I mean, life is really about um, overcoming obstacles yeah. and about finding things that you can, you can feel good about yourself with. And uh, going to audition for Phantom and putting myself in that position in front of um, Hal Prince's people and Andrew Lloyd Webber's people yeah. was fine. They certainly don't need me in the show. But did you have to prove that, uh, that Paul Stanley was not a rock singer? He was a singer who did rock and other things. Well, sure, because... Um, you know, you are always dealing with people's preconceived ideas, but I can't live within the confines that other people set up for me. For me, I have to push the envelope as far as I can. Um, how people want to stereotype me or whatever is really their problem. Yeah. And for me, it's always a matter of, of um, reaffirming who I am for myself. So going in and auditioning, sure. Um, 
I don't really see myself as a rock singer anyway. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a singer who sings rock. And if I choose to go elsewhere, I'll either stand or fall on the merits. Let's take a little look at elsewhere. Here is Paul Stanley in Phantom of the Opera. Music shall caress you here. We'll get your review. You haven't seen yourself on stage. That's right. That's right. I'm a big <laughs> fan of that guy, but I'm also my own harshest critic. So, yeah. um, you know, this, this is, I'm a very lucky guy. I've worked real hard to become lucky, but, uh, yeah. you know, life has been fabulous for me. You went and took voice lessons. You did everything to prepare for this. You know, I, I would never take something on unless I was going to give it my all. Yeah. You know, um, I didn't take it on to be okay. I didn't take it on to be, all right, he's got some time off and he's going right. to kill some time. There's an audience every night that pays really hard-earned money, you know, to see the show. And uh, quite a bit of them are, are theater, you know, I was going to say, people. it's hard to imagine the hardcore uh, KISS Army there. But, of course, the hardcore KISS Army has grown up, too. Well, it's fabulous <laughs> because, you know, I, I think theater has so many bad connotations attached to it. I think many people are intimidated by the idea of theater and that somehow it appeals to a, an elite group of people yeah. who show up in white gloves and clap right. like that. And Shakespeare wrote for the common, you know, common man, so to go to theater is such a great way to spend an evening. So I want people who wouldn't go to come, and I want the regular theater goers to be there also. And uh, the cast is absolutely brilliant. So there's people that stand up at night to give you the standing ovation at the end of this who don't know who or what KISS is. They may have never seen it or heard it. And, and that's, that's so gratifying because adulation is wonderful, but if people love everything you do, then how much do they love any of it? Yeah. If, if somebody comes in not knowing what to expect or if somebody comes in thinking they're not going to like it, um, then all the more reason to feel good at the end when there's a standing ovation. I must say, you know, the cast is brilliant. <laughs> and uh, I'm very lucky to be working with the people I'm working with because uh, they give me an incredible amount of support and encouragement. And I don't want to let them down any more than I would let the audience down. Do you feel this pulling in another way? I mean, you have been on and off stage and kisses broken up and got back together and done all of this. Do you feel that something's opening up for you? Well, I've always wanted to pursue this. I, I don't think that anything ever excludes anything else. Um, yeah. I think it was about four months ago we played the Sky Dome. Yeah. So to come here and do the Pantages eight times a week <laughs> is, um, you know, it, it's just a dream come true. A anything that I get to do um, that I've set as a goal for myself is wonderful. I don't usually have dreams because dreams put you in a position to believe that something's out of reach, that it's a fantasy. But goals are something we can all reach. Yeah. And this was one. Absolutely. You said seeing Phantom the first time was the almost the equivalent of your first experience with the Beatles, of listening and hearing the Beatles. Yeah. Um, I really felt when I first saw the Beatles, and I was a fat little unpopular kid, <laughs> I, I saw the Beatles and I went, you know, I can't do what they're doing, but I know I can touch the nerve they're touching. And I couldn't play an instrument at the time, but I, I understood innately what was going on there. And when I saw Phantom the first time, I just sat in the audience and I went, God, I, I can do this, you know, mm. and I want to do it because I think I have something to offer. You know, I think I, I can bring something to the role that touches people perhaps in a way others haven't. Uh, it's so hard to imagine the, the fat little Jewish boy trouble. Oh, kid. trust me. <laughs> trust me. He's still here. He's inside. Amazing. Yeah. And on the stage, let's take a look as we go to this break at Paul Stanley with Kiss. Tater.
Kiss Unplug 1996. Our guest Paul Stanley, of course, the lead singer of Kiss, and now starring in the lead role of Phantom of the Opera in Canada. The fans didn't respond when you took your makeup off. Well, it's very interesting because we're in a position where anything less than what we originally had in terms of success is somehow viewed as... As a failure. As a failure, <laughs> which is really interesting because during the... Let's see, we took off the makeup in 83. Mm -hmm. Between 1983 and 1996, when we reunited the original lineup, I think we sold 15 million albums. But now, that's a failure. Those, those were the lean years. Those <laughs> exactly. lean years would make most people very fat. Yeah. So it, it's very interesting because we compete with a past that is so huge yeah. that it took the reunion tour to really eclipse what we had done initially. We wound up on the cover of Forbes magazine. Exactly. Now, if I had to pick a magazine I would never be on the cover of, it would surely be Forbes, but there we were as a marketing and a merchandising and a musical success story. Well, you know, I think that we've, we've built KISS in the best ways into a, a, a coveted trademark yeah. and into something that's much bigger than a band, and yet certainly is still a band. We had the largest tour of the year in 96, 97, played to about uh, two and a half million people. What was it about the timing that worked? Why did KISS work then? Why did, wh wh what was going through your head when you sat in the room and said, okay, we're going to put all this makeup on, you know, we're going to smash guitars, we're going to do all this stuff. Where did it come from? I think, basically, we wanted to be the band that we never saw. Um, again, I think that entertainment suffers so much when people don't get their money's worth. And as somebody who's bought tickets my entire life, there's nothing worse than spending a lot of money and seeing yeah. something go, what did I what did I pay for? It's no different than going to the market and getting an empty sack when you bought groceries. Yeah. So we tried to put together the show that we never saw and uh, really take things over the top and give people real spectacle for their money. Um, when you come to see a KISS show to this day, <laughs> you know where the money is. It's, it's all around you. When we yeah. got back together with the original lineup in 96, we put on a show that eclipsed what we had done initially. Um, that's really what it's all about. I mean, I, I think there are so many bands around, and God bless them, and I hope they stay successful, who really shortchanged the fans. But the critics also sort of made the point that the pyrotechnics were there to kind of make up for the lack of musical complexity. Is well, that fair? Well, let's address critics for a moment. <laughs> Crit critics are a very interesting bunch because they perform a service that nobody's really interested in for the most part. <laughs> they don't have a degree in being critics. No, it's true. You read and critics and then say, I disagree with yeah. that. Well, most of it, it's creative writing because yeah. how much credence can you give to somebody who writes an article and didn't pay for a ticket? Yeah. Most critics believe their place is to tell you what you don't know and why they, in essence, know more than you do, that somehow they, they can educate you to a higher existence. Well, the masses aren't really interested. You know, and um, I'm part of the masses, and I'm really not interested in being talked down to. And I think critics have a tendency to do that. And from where they're talking down to, I have questioned in the first place. But that's an important part of, of what you do and what all performers do, is that, you know, you need the rave review or maybe even to respond to the bad review, whatever it is, uh, as I, long as they spell the name right, yeah, as the I, saying goes. I find, I find no need to respond to reviews because at the end of every show at Phantom, for example, mm -hmm. there's a standing ovation. There are nights we're selling stools because there's no seats available. Yeah. People are leaving there raving. So, in I, I you don't care what from the, the bottom of say. my heart, if a critic enjoys the show, that's great. But those people who come from from miles around yeah. and hours away and see the show and are thrilled are the only ones who count because they're spending hard-earned money to come see it. And when somebody comes in with a chip on their shoulder, most of the time thinking yeah. they've seen everything. That's really not a healthy place to write from. So how do you compare the performance aspects of KISS, which is I'm sure how you would describe it, with the performance aspects of Phantom, of playing that role? It's very, very different um, because with KISS, my, my feeling is that I am involving the audience through a very conscious interaction back and forth, whereas in Phantom or any theater, the audience becomes, it's almost like uh, being a voyeur. You're watching from mm -hmm. the outside, you're the fly on the wall. You're watching the, the interaction that's on stage take place, but um, there's no conscious um, pulling of the audience in. It can only be done by, by good performing. Yeah. So it's very, very different. In one, you're constantly acknowledging the audience, and the other one, you're never paying them any, any mind at all. 
because the connection has to be so strong with the people on stage that that's what they're that that's what they're buying into. What is the connection with Kiss? What are those fans and now of all ages because the boomers of course start out with you are still with you in in large numbers. What are they responding to? I think there's Kiss inside everybody. I think the the idea that um, as we get older we have to get old or that as you you mature that means that life becomes less fun or that we have to constantly dwell on the negatives in life I think what we've always sung about is um, celebrating life the positives in it we all know that there's bad things we all mm -hmm. know that there's negatives but life is a miracle you know and we're all here and we, we can make so much of what's going on and why not enjoy ourselves sex whatever it is you know um, as long as we're not hurting anybody else and we're not hurting ourselves, I'm all for it. You've got uh, a little boy that yes. just turned five? Yes, yesterday. Do you want him listening to Kiss? Um, yeah. I, um, I've never done anything that, that I have a problem with. You know, I would never do something that um, I think would lead people down the wrong path. And I certainly would never sing about something that I don't live. I think it's mm -hmm. real dangerous when there's people who are purporting to be one thing at the expense of an audience because they they set themselves up um, whether they want to or not as heroes or idols and perhaps what they're selling isn't honest I would never sing about something that I don't feel very comfortable with you know I'm, I'm not here as a a saint or a martyr but yeah. certainly I mean, there's a song that Kiss does called Cold Gin now we wrote that 20 years ago but before we sing it now I'm I'm only comfortable if I tell the audience listen if you're going to drink, have somebody else drive you. You know, mm -hmm. if, you, if you came here and you're drinking, don't drive yourself. I know, but you know what you used to say on stage about that. Yeah, and... I'll drive you, and you know, I, mean, yeah, I won't repeat but, it all here. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> um, I'm accountable for my past, but I have nothing that, that I'm ashamed of. You know, I, I, I feel very comfortable with everything I've ever done. All right, we're going to take uh, another look at Kiss the Face Back On and then return with our conversation in just a moment. Stanley is our guest, lead singer of KISS, now performing in Phantom of the Opera. KISS, 27 albums, 75 million copies. Pretty good record. <laughs> it's Not bad. huge. Yeah, it's wonderful. Are you surprised at your own longevity? Absolutely. You know, when we first started out, all I was hoping for, if we got five years of fame, I would yeah. have just been thrilled to death. I mean, here it is almost 30 years later, mm -hmm. um, between 75 and 80 million records. Um, I've got my health. Yeah. I've got, you know, a, a wonderful wife who's incredibly supportive and, and bright and creative in her own right, a great mother. I've got, a, a, you know, a great child. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the horizons just keep going on. Every time I climb a mountain, I see a one a little taller next to it, and then I say, let me climb that one. I mean, you know the debate that's out there about the stones and all of this. I mean, you're 47 years old, a couple of knee operations, a shoulder operation from all that leaping about and, and guitar smashing and, and all of that. Can you just keep doing that? I can do it as long as, um, I can do it as long as I'm enjoying it, and I can do it as long as I feel I'm living up to what people expect. Yeah. Um, the day that I'm not having fun anymore, or the day that I think someone's going to say, remember when he was really good, is the time to leave. <laughs> Will you know that? Will you know when, when you're not performing or whether, and you look out into the audience, they're responding for what you think is the wrong reason? I'm my own harshest critic. You know, I, I have to tell you in the best way that, you know, at the end of the, the day, all of us have to look in the mirror and, and either like or not like what they see. Yeah. And I like it every night. <laughs> The, the group, back together again, um, does it really work? I mean, you know the rumors are out there that you're fighting and all of this stuff. We do fight. Yeah. Um, you know, husbands fight with their wives. Right. 
fathers fight with their children, brothers fight with their brothers and sisters. There's nothing wrong with fighting. Fighting is healthy. I think when people don't um, express themselves or don't verbalize what's going on, that's where you have your problems. Um, the greatest thing with the band as it is now is that everybody um, really totes their own weight. And, um, you know, perhaps in years gone by, everybody would look at the other and blame them mm -hmm. for whatever predicament the other guy was in. And now everybody stands up and takes responsibility. Um, we're very honest with each other, and that's the best way to have a healthy relationship. But we get on great. You know, I, I can't tell you how supportive everybody's been. And uh, is everybody past the sex, drugs, and rock and roll phase? Well, you know, speaking for myself. <laughs> yeah, we'll only ask you to speak for yourself. I guess that's true. I was never an advocate yeah. of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I always told people, you keep the drugs, just give me the sex and the rock and roll. <laughs> you know, um, drugs to me are, are, are the bane of, of everyone's existence. They're poison. Mm -hmm. They're, they can only cause harm. I've seen people die. Yeah. You know, there's nothing glamorous about, ab about drugs or what they do. If, if they were so good, you'd probably have interviewed Jimi Hendrix, Janis yeah. Joplin, yeah. John Belushi. You know, drugs can't do anything good for anybody, and, and I, I would urge everybody to, to stay away. Was that part of the split, too, with the, the alcohol and drug abuse by a couple? Uh, yeah, I, I think, yes. well, certainly. You know, we all had, fame brings all sorts of poisons and demons out. You know, you, um, your ego gets way out of check, and all kinds of distortions come in. You have people around you who are salaried to tell you how great you are. Yeah. And sometimes you forget they're getting a paycheck. Um, then you also have all these, you know, other uh, influences, whether it's drugs or, or women or, or, you know, alcohol. Yeah. And it, it can really be the downfall of, of some very talented people. Did you see that in yourself when you had women throwing themselves at your feet and anything was possible or viable? I loved every minute. You know, I think if you see things for what they are, why not enjoy them for what they are? You know, beautiful women, if they only want to be with you because of who you are, as long as everybody understands the deal, let's have fun. That's what it was about, <laughs> you know? Let's all be honest with each other and, and uh, leave smiling. But you're the one with the power in that situation. You're the rock star. Um, women have been incredibly powerful for a long, long time. They tend to lead men around very well. So most of those situations you were in, you believe women were there by choice? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh -huh. You know, whether it was to um, uh, lift part of their dream or to touch what they think is stardom yeah. or to feel important, that's all well and good. You know, there, there's a part of that, you know, whether a woman decides she wants to marry a doctor or a rock star, what's the difference? They're both, you know, they're both after something and they both have goals. And uh, <laughs> who are we to knock either? <laughs> Paul Stanley is our guest. We'll continue our conversation right after this break. And members of the Kiss Army, there. Where did where did you dream up Star Child from? Um, I always liked the idea of being, a, you know, a star. And maybe at that point I was too lazy to put two stars on, so I quit <laughs> after one. <laughs> but you love the makeup. Yes, very much. Yeah, it's very much an extension of a certain side of me. I think um, what made Kiss work and makes Kiss continue to work is partially that um, everything that comes from us comes from within you know, within and from inside us. So um, none of us could switch makeup. We would look ridiculous, mm -hmm. at least to ourselves. Um, it very much came from each one of us. Then it kind of turned into the marketing. Um, well, it was just such an amazing story. There's everything, and you're doing that still. Cigars, mm -hmm. chocolate bars, motorcycles, Whatever. clothes, you don't care. What it, well, within reason. Yeah. You know, there, there's certainly a... Uh, a, a desire to not let the merchandise eclipse the band or overshadow the band. But we're in a very unique position because um, 
when we first started doing all the merchandise, we were lambasted and, and criticized. Rock and roll bands don't do that. Mm -hmm. As soon as all the rock and roll bands saw how much money there was to yeah. be made, lo and behold, every rock and roll band was doing the same thing. Are you a millionaire? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, it's safe to say I work because I enjoy working. <laughs> I'm sure it's safe to say that. And you and Jean have the, I mean, you're doing all the marketing and all of that yourselves now in terms of where well, the revenue is going. We certainly always have overseen yeah. everything, and yeah. we, we've been the constant in the band since the beginning. <laughs> You've got your very own action figure. Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. That's what I look like when I spend five days a week in the gym, which That's I have That's working done for out. This, would, this yes. would be Barbie, of course, not Ken, given the makeup well, here. Well, if you put that doll together with Barbie, you get little dolls. <laughs> but that, I mean, I don't know. Again, you've got the, the, the question with the child and the kid going, yes. you know, this is my dad. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you'd have to meet my son. He's, he's extraordinary. He's a wonderful, wonderful little boy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, He's certainly been exposed to a lot, and he's traveled the world, and he goes to theater, and he goes yeah. to museums, and uh, what's so bad about action figures? The difference is most action figures are fantasies, yeah. you know, and, and imaginary characters. But so is Kiss a fantasy. Yes, but we're also the embodiment of, of something that comes from each one of us, mm -hmm. and is something that's found in everybody around us. But um, it really is an extension of who we are, you know, and it's a, Kiss has always been about a belief in oneself. And it's that belief in oneself that has me being Phantom of the Opera now, you know, um, believing that I could do it. Mm -hmm. Certainly, if I had decided to become a mathematician, I would have been a fool. Or an anthropologist. Didn't you uh, want to do that? Yes, at one point? anthropology <laughs> was was very interesting, but um, I'm terrible at math. Yeah. So to to pursue something that doesn't have possibilities is crazy. But um, I think if each one of us would spend a little time thinking about what we really would like to do and whether it's possible to do it, we'd succeed at it. Do you think, though, that, this, that the screaming fans, the ones that are there, are thinking, this is about pursuing my goals and reaching oh, for the stars? absolutely. I believe that, that KISS is every man. I believe that KISS is the American dream, the Canadian dream. I think it's people sitting down and saying, what can I do to pay my rent and also love my life you know having a job isn't a bad thing having a job you hate is a bad thing mm -hmm. and each one of us has it within us to find something we love doing and you're the american dream because you can take the action dolls and the motorcycles and all of those things and make a bazillion dollars well yeah but the american dream is 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 the same dream that's uh, felt around the world and that's to succeed in life mm -hmm. and not have to play by any rules except your own so that's my dream, and my dream came true. You know? where's, the, where's the sense of, and, and I know what you're saying on an individual basis, that this is about living your own life, making your own rules, mm -hmm. but that's a very individual approach. That isn't about being your brother's keeper or, oh, or that, that, caring It doesn't about negate any of that, because I think charity is, is, is very, very important. I think giving back mm -hmm. is, is at least as important. You know, it's great to make money, and it's great to do well, but it's also very important for each one of us in our own way, whether you're me or you yeah. or anyone else, to say, how can I give something back? What do you do? How do you feel you give back? Um, other than trying to be a positive role model, um, on the American tour, we pledged, I think, a million meals to children uh, over the course of the, the tour, which hasn't ended, through an organization called Feed the Children. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I'm very, very leery of standing up on a, a soapbox and, and telling people, do what I do. But I felt that that was a really good cause and that by raising the awareness, certainly people could see the p potential to give back. So um, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with taking and doing well. I have no guilt. I sleep very yeah. well. I earned every dollar that I've got. But it doesn't, it, it doesn't feel good unless you give back. Do the, the, the violence that occurs on stage... Not violence, never. But, but it is in a sense. Mm, uh, if you no. smash guitars, if you break. No, you know, maybe to somebody who sits in an armchair and eats macaroni and cheese at night and watches, you know, Married with Children, maybe that looks like, <laughs> like violence. But to me, it's just high energy and uh, it's exciting. It's certainly, it, it, it's entertainment and it's not anything near what you see on CNN or on CBC. Yeah. It's amazing to have, you know, 
have these situations that we've had in schools with kids shooting yeah. each other and have people on news shows going, gee, why is this happening? Well, because you're broadcasting all kinds of things in the name of news that you shouldn't be. So perhaps You're not going to sit here and tell me you're in favor of censorship. Oh, I'm, I'm certainly in favor of people in positions of power using a little bit of common sense when it comes to showing people in crisis situations shooting themselves or shooting other people uh, just to get ratings and put that on the news and then afterwards go, gee, I wonder why people are shooting each other mm -hmm. in schools. Because you're putting it on television. And I think that all of you would yeah. do much better to look at yourselves than to look at me. When uh, going through the Littleton situation, of course, and an incident here in Canada, and, and of course now there are copycat situations everywhere, but one of the threads was, and you touched on this earlier, these, these kids, you described yourself that way, kind of out of it, uh, you know, the fat kid that felt sort of separate and apart and, and almost ostracized, and we hear that in the descriptions of these kids that are involved in the goth music or whatever they're doing and lash out this way. Do you buy that or do you just um, think they're well, screwed up kids? You know, it's, always, it's, always, it's dangerous to find simple solutions mm -hmm. because they're mm -hmm. usually not as simple. I think parents have a tremendous obligation to watch their children and look for signs and not be in a state of denial. When you see your child doing something that frightens you, instead of turning the other way, it's a good thing to deal with. Additionally, you know, when People in everyday um, life would see an accident where somebody got brutally killed. They would get counseling. There's trauma counseling. The kind of crap that's being shown on the news every day without any sort of counseling to the people who are watching it is a travesty because it desensitizes children and, and young people to what violence is all about. It makes it an everyday occurrence instead of really ripping at your heart. And that's something that, once again, the media should be looking at, mm -hmm. instead of looking at me, I mean, give me a break. So what's the role of entertainment? To entertain, but I think everybody has to have a, a good conscience about what is entertaining and what crosses that line. I can't, you know, I can only speak for myself. You know, that, that's, that's a, a big question. Mm -hmm. You know, entertainment, everybody but has But do you have to take responsibility? I mean, if someone gets up and, you know, I, I don't want to go to extreme measures here, but I mean, if, if, if kids start to act the way you guys act on stage, which is performance, right. but if they're doing that with, uh, you know, the school band equipment, well, and someone says, you know, or, yeah, breathing terrible, fire. Maybe or they're spinning playing terribly, water. and they should smash their trumpets, but... Um, <laughs> I'm real comfortable with what I do. If somebody puts a towel around their neck and jumps out a window because they saw Superman, I don't really think that the Superman movie is responsible. There are some, some people, some children, some adults with real problems, mm -hmm. and we can't accept responsibility for all of that. So it becomes an individual call then that parents have to take that responsibility with your, with your kids and sit down and say, this is news and this is entertainment and understand Who that. else? Yeah. Who else? Who it's else? It's hard these days, though, you know. Who else is going to do it if not you? If you can't watch television and turn it on and say, this is not acceptable, who else is going to do it? You don't have to answer to anybody else. You have to know in your heart what's good for you and what's good for your child. Paul Stanley is our guest lead singer with KISS and now performing in Phantom. Stay with us. Our conversation continues in just a moment. We continue our conversation now with Paul Stanley, lead singer from the group King A Kiss and now performing as Phantom of the Opera. Rumors. One of the wildest rumors, and it's just weird enough to be true, let me just ask, that in, 19, in a 1977 Kiss comic book, the red ink used contained small amounts of blood drawn from the four band members. Over 400,000 copies were sold. That's true, and just imagine, you could take that red ink now and clone us, and you could wind up with your own you Kiss could. member. You could. You really could. Yes, you could. Was that marketing, pure and simple? That was having fun. That was, gee, wouldn't it be crazy to put our <laughs> blood into the red ink? Then we could say we really put our blood into this. <laughs> Gene Simmons, reported seven-inch tongue, has been surgically enhanced with the addition of the tongue of a cow. Well, as we know, most human transplants <laughs> don't work. I, I would highly doubt that a cow transplant would work. He just he, has a seven-inch tongue. He's been tongue. known to moo. But. 
All right, during the 1996 tour, the 40-foot inflatable images, yes. dolls of yourselves, you sent them back to the manufacturer to have bigger private parts put on. Yes. I looked at mine and I thought it would look like Wonder Woman. <laughs> I said, come on, you know, if you're going to make me that big, let's at least scale things to the right proportions. <laughs> so I said, send that thing back and, and make him look like Paul. Is there anything you've ever done that you actually regret? No, not at all. You know, it, the, I really believe that some of the biggest mistakes are the ones you learn the most from. And yeah. I wouldn't be here today without the mistakes. You know, I mean, it, we, we learn so little from the, our successes. And if we're smart, the mistakes are what we really what, you learn what from. we learn from. Ace, one of the the members, the original members, and back again. Is it true that he is contractually bound to stay sober? Um, it is highly suggested that we <laughs> all do our best to to give the fans the best show that we can. When we got back together, the original lineup, we spent five or six months with physical trainers and in rehearsals because, you know, your your past cast this huge shadow. And what mm -hmm. people remember of us is sometimes much greater than what was actually there. So we had to come back and be even better, look better, sound better. So we took it very seriously. There's nothing worse than having people hoping and praying for a reunion or anything else, mm -hmm. and then they get it and they don't like it. Yeah. So we're very, very dedicated in all aspects. I mean, that's what I bring to Phantom, too. You know, There's nothing that we should ever do unless we're willing to do it 110%. And, and that's, that's my motto. Living with that expectation uh, that, that people want to, and I guess all boomers to a certain extent are, are trying to make sure that they, they have youth for as long as possible. And in a sense, you have come to represent that uh, for a lot of people. Because as long as you're still leaping around on stage and doing all that kind of stuff, then we can't feel old. It's a nice thought. Um, I don't think that feeling young or, or having a young um, perspective has anything to do with how high you can leap or whether you can <laughs> run from one end of the stage to the other or how good you look in a pair of tights without a shirt on. But, and I look pretty damn good. <laughs> yeah, not, not bad. But, uh, you know, it, it's all about, you know, your, your frame of mind. My parents are, are my dad's going to be 80 next year and he's just as sharp as a whip and they travel the world and they're wonderful people and it, it's, you know, you'll have your time to die. Don't do yeah. it while you're alive. What on earth? I mean, that's a really interesting question, your parents. I mean, here you grew up, uh, you know, in, in relatively modest circumstances. I think, was your dad a furniture? Yeah, he was a furniture salesman. Salesman. Yeah. And, and Paul grows up and he dons the makeup and he leaps around on stage and, you know, engages in bizarre behavior, to say the least. What are mom and dad thinking? That's my boy. <laughs> you know, um, my parents know me well, and uh, they're very happy, and they live a very good life. And I have to say, You've been able to give that. In large part, yeah, yeah, due to me. And that's, that's a big joy for me, you know, to be able to give my parents a, a great life. And, and uh, you know, the blessings that I have through my success should, should be shared, you know? What, how will you then um, take these ideas and apply them to being a father yourself? You can give your son anything that he wants. He'd probably never have to work a day in his life. What, a, that, what could be worse than that? You know, money can be such a, a burden uh, if, if it's not earned or, or taken in the right way. So what will and you do? Never, how will you deal with that? I think that um, that has to be something that is kept away and also the value of money has to be taught. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me at this point, all money is is, is a, a way to stop thinking about money. So now mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about it. But I work, you know, real hard for it. So. But it goes on all the time. I mean, you had to fight. You had bad managers early mm -hmm. on that really ripped you guys off. Mm -hmm. um, you had to fight to buy back your name. Mm -hmm. Someone else had the rights to that. Um, yeah, in, in one way or another. We, we certainly did a lot of fighting for to, to regain you know, total control of ourselves. You're still in court, I think, now over lyrics. Uh, no, Alice that, Cooper that's, suggesting that that's uh, that's that's so minor. You know, I mean, I won the lottery. I don't complain about the taxes. You know, <laughs> when you're as when you do as well as I've done, life is great. You know, and um, and that's I, just there because you have money and you have success, and so you will be a target. Yeah, you know, part of part of how you can judge your success level is how many people want to sue you. <laughs> you know, they don't sue you when you're broke. Yeah. You know, and for my son, the most important thing is to teach him values, morality, ethics, 
you know, a whole lot of things that may sound traditional, but the reason they're traditional and they're, you know, there is tradition is because those things work. Mm -hmm. And that's what life's all about, is about treating people well and about having a good sense about yourself and, and uh, how you view the world and what you give back to the world. What do you um, listen to in terms of music? Um, everything. I think there's, there's no bigger disservice than to listen to one kind of music. Mm -hmm. That's, that would be as crazy as eating one kind of food. Yeah. If you ate one kind of food, you'd be terribly undernourished. And if you just spent all your time listening to one kind of music, how much, you know, how much uh, are you bringing to is, the party? Is there anything <laughs> new that you hear that you think is extraordinary that is going to set it apart? It's very hard to imagine after rock and roll something being that large and that profound in terms of representing uh, a redefinition of what music was? Something will come along. You know, I, I think the Beatles were something so special because they, they really um, embodied a, a whole new way of thinking. It wasn't just music. It was, it was revolutionary in its style, mm -hmm. in fashion, in everything that was going on in the world. You saw it in you know, yeah. presidents and different leaders. So nothing like that is going on now, but there's certainly tremendous diversity in music, which is great because everybody gets a chance to hear something they like, but everybody should listen to more. More music. Absolutely, yeah. and more different kinds. But what, what appeals to you about the new stuff? Do you listen to? You know, I, I mean, I will listen to the Spice Girls, and I'll, <laughs> in the next minute I'm listening to um, um, Tony Bennett, and the next minute I'm listening to Led Zeppelin, and the next minute I want to listen to Alanis Morissette. I mean, there's just too much music out there, and all of it has something to offer. In terms of the role that that has to play, and we've had this discussion a lot of times on the program about the importance of art and, and how you put that into people's lives. When you think about even, you know, contemporary terms, and Andrea Bocelli, who brings opera to pop listeners. Mm -hmm. He's done the cross over there. Uh, do you feel that you can keep translating that, that you have a role in I don't, that? I don't want, I, I'm certainly not on a crusade, but the idea that I can do something I love, that I can do theater, which I intend to continue doing, mm -hmm. and to do phantom, and perhaps get some people who've never been into a theater to come in and leave there going, this is better than a lot of movies I've seen. This is better than going to, to see films. And gee, I'm not out of place here. Gee, everybody here isn't wearing a tuxedo. Yeah. Um, what a great thing, you know, turn people on to theater or anything else. It's great. It's really been a pleasure talking with you. It's uh, you. interesting to get behind the mask and, and inside the head. Yeah. How long does it take to put that face on anyway? This one? <laughs> Either one, both uh, Phantom or Kiss. Phantom takes about um, a good 45 minutes, yeah. and, and there's more glue and things on my face <laughs> than it takes to put a, a model together. <laughs> Thanks so Thank much. Thank you so much. And enjoy your run. Paul Thank Stanley, you. lead singer of Kiss, and now performing in Phantom of the Opera. Let's take a little listen to some Kiss as we say goodbye. <laughs>